So we, this being the the last time that we have a chance to be at this end of the, of, the <laughs> of, of this dividing line, this is what I listen to. Uh, David and I would like to have a little discussion of what uh, uh, what you think uh, you have learned and what uh, what are the what are the values to your future careers of learning about this great adventure and going to the moon. Who wants to start? <clears throat> And John Tucker will obviously talk about Columbia a little bit later, but we don't have any formal time to talk about Apollo anymore. So one time to just sort of summarize what we've learned about the history that maybe surprised you. or I think one of the greatest impacts is the realization and understanding of the, the politics and how it's not just about having a good plan or a, or a good design. There's lots of other factors that come into play. Just you know, politicians vying for getting you know, business in their state or getting federal funds uh, mm -hmm. plays, a, plays a large role in how everything ends up playing out. I, uh, I often talk about, and you, other people do too, politics with a big P, which is politicians and Washington and elections and that sort of stuff, which is important in the way you said. And then also politics with a little P, which is the more local, all the stuff about the different centers and the just even within the offices, how those things kind of play out. But you also see with something like the LOR decision that there's a lot of analytical engineering content to that decision, but there's also these, who are the key stakeholders, what's going to bring them on board, sort of thing. You know, this was, we've heard about this from guest lecturers as well from, as from, uh, from David, that this was, in a sense, the first large-scale systems engineering demonstration. So every, everywhere from the financial planning right through the, the integration. Uh, was it a success? Uh, I don't mean did we get to the rule. Was it a success in terms of practicing systems engineering? <coughs> uh, one I mean, James Webb was, 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 after he left NASA, he went into business as a consultant and he consulted on uh, how to apply NASA engineering methods to urban poverty and urban transportation. And there was a whole movement after Apollo to take these methods and apply them to these kind of domestic problems w without a lot of success in most of those cases, actually. It was a much better method for designing a system like Apollo than for solving a problem like urban poverty, where the, the results are, it's very hard to know what you're measuring. I think there was some value in seeing, uh, have, having the project kind of humanized. So we got to see some of the, the stories of people that built the, the computer here at the Draper Lab. Or uh, I was thinking particularly of um, Tom Kelly, and he even wrote in his book some like difficulties in his marriage that, that came up because he was so like engaged in the project. And to see that people made sacrifices to make this thing happen, it wasn't just like a you know it didn't just come out of thin air. It was people working. You know. yeah. Yeah, when you hear, as you heard a lot in the 60s, Apollo was this kind of technology run amok, right? It was really the kind of origin of that whole idea. And you go, what, which part of this is technology with a capital P? Is it Don Isles? Is it Joe Shea? Is it all those technicians? I mean, it's, it's just people working on these things. That one thing that I didn't have a real realization for was all the other things that were going on in the 60s at the same time as Apollo, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of civil rights and the, I mean, you can easily see, yeah, those have the same dates in history, but you never really think like, wow, this was going on at the same time as Alabama. the, as the Higgins, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> it's like, just yeah. very, very much put it into mm -hmm. context and, I don't know, it seemed even more amazing considering the times. <clears throat> yeah, there was a book... Pretty good book if you ever want to read yet another book on Apollo called Moon Dust, and it's a um, just an English journalist came. This was maybe ten years ago and went around and interviewed a lot of the astronauts, and you know he said at the end of the day, at the time everyone thought the hippies and Apollo were like two polar opposites of the spectrum. One was the big bad mil military industrial complex, and one was freedom and love and utopia. But but in retrospect, they look a lot more similar. They were both these kind of utopian projects of the time which had visions of a better future, neither one of which quite played out in the way that people expected them to. People today, I think, are a lot more cynical on both sides. One interesting thing is that as 
engineers, we get a lot of we do get a lot of background, or we expect a lot of background on the build up for Apollo and the actual structure, and then we hear a lot about the the, the landings themselves. But looking at a lot of uh, in the context of a lot of the engineering that went on after the missions, after Apollo 11, like when the missions had already started, uh, there was still development, still design, and mm -hmm. things that were, they were still working on after they'd officially been canceled. Uh, getting that kind of sense of how even though, oh, your program's canceled, you, expect, you kind of expect these days, it's like, oh, it's ending, and everybody just feels like, oh, it's over. But during Apollo, they just kept going. Yeah. You know, sure. In, related to that is, for me, the impressive fact that the cha these changes would take place, and the next flights would take place two months later, and they would be, get implemented in, in a period of time that is amazingly short by today's standards. Certainly would not have happened during the show. I was just reading today the, uh, the, the SLS, the big new launcher coming out of Huntsville. First flight with the unmanned Orion, I think, is 2016 or 2017? 2014. Unmanned flight. Unmanned is 14. First 14 is, is, the, is the Orion capsule on a Delta IV. Okay, right. First manned flight, four years later. Um, whereas in Apollo, it was what? You know, two months? Or, or zero months in the, the first time they launched. <laughs> the thing that astounded me was I think that schedule, schedule is possible because the amount of money that was being thrown yeah. problem. While they are also doing the whole Great Society thing, while they are also fighting the war in Vietnam, just looking at what the federal budget must have looked like at the time. <laughs> and the Cold War. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, not to mention being on, you know, twenty-four-seven nuclear alert. Yeah. So, how did they manage that? I that that's the, well, taxes something were higher, that among other things. Really mm -hmm. astounds me, and I haven't been able to quite clear up in my head. I mean, the dollar numbers on Apollo weren't all that big, right, um, compared to, and, and this is still true today, any big contractor who builds human spaceflight art where it's a small part of their business and, you know, in some sense, they treat it as a loss leader because it's high prestige and it's interesting work, but they make their money on, the, you know, the F-16s, the F-15s, and the, the tankers and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think part of the answer to your question about how did they, how did they achieve these uh, these accomplishments so rapidly uh, is arguably that we were less risk averse as a society in the 60s than we are now, and so people not not not, not foolhardy risks, but they took calculated risks in order to push the program ahead. And I think I feel that at this at, at this time, if anything, we are uh, too uh, we are too conservative in, uh, in human history. I really enjoyed seeing the Soviet program and the parallels that were drawn between that and throughout Mercury and Gemini and Apollo. And I guess prior to this class, I never re re made the realization that they were so far ahead of us up until basically the very end mm -hmm. at the lunar landing. So that was that was really interesting. A lot of that material is material that didn't even exist until ten years ago. I mean, so a lot of it's stuff people didn't know at the time. It also gives you a nice sense of like. How do you go to the moon? Well, we did it this way, but you know what? If you had a different group of people, you probably would have chosen to do it another way. There's there are commonalities because the physics are the same, but the, there's a lot of differences in how you might organize it. Yeah, so there's um, obviously Siddiqui's book, Challenge to Apollo, which is, you know, you, 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 can, you can work out with it because it's, it's so thick. Um, the, the book that Dave Scott wrote with um, Alexei Leonov is actually really readable and good. There's Boris Chertok wrote, what, how many, four, four volumes now? Rockets and People, which is sort of the, a real detailed first-hand account of, that's not all necessarily a lunar program, it's the, the space, and it's hard to disentangle as, we, as we've seen. There's a very um, good biography called Call of by James, James Hartford. Hartford. <coughs> Mm -hmm. I really like just like all the different perspectives we did. It was almost like every class was a new perspective, and it was cool to look at it from the technical perspective because I think we've all kind of grown up with like the story, story type of perspective. Um, but even like the last class, like having you know having 
come in with all the, just his collection of stuff, and at first you're like, all right, this is just a bunch of stuff. And like hearing him tell the stories about yeah. like, why it's important, and like this went to the moon. Like that was a really cool perspective that you wouldn't have gotten, and I never really thought about. And it's just neat to see like all the different ways that this has impacted people, and not just like engineering or the political, but just like this guy. Yeah. No, like that's and there's a lot of people like him, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, again, you look at that Apollo Lunar Surface Journal website. You know, people who are just serious amateur scholars put that together. A lot of time, a lot of effort. And there's a guy. This is actually written up in the New York Times, and he wrote to me. He he built a full copy of the Apollo guidance computer in his basement, like a a, a large one, not a, a micro one, but big enough that you could sort of see the whole architecture. And um, and he was. I sent him a bunch of the schematics and stuff that I had found when I was doing the work, and uh, and then he was done with it. And he was like, you know, the reporter asked him, "What are you going to do with it now?" He said, "I just want to get rid of it because I want to build something else." <laughs> but then, can you imagine the level of effort to go through those original drawings and and reproduce all of that digital hardware? It's amazing. Uh, also, you know. Larry McGlynn really gives you this window into this whole kind of informal subcultures in Apollo of all the little paintings and the practical jokes and all that sort of stuff, which is very hard to get into the history books, actually, because it doesn't get written down. It's kind of oral stuff that's passed on, and, and there was a lot of that, all these funny little traditions that they developed. Can I have a last word? Sure. Okay, this, uh, unless something dramatically changes, this is my last class after 51 years of teaching here. Oh, wow, that's right. Uh, and what I wanted to say is that this has been a blast, not just this class, but in general, the notion of coming to work each, uh, each day and meeting with MIT students as smart as you are as, uh, and as interested as you are in trying to find out what's going on anywhere from F equals MA to the rocket equation to why are we, uh, why are we investigating the, uh, the human genome is just, just an amazing privilege. So I thank not only you guys, but all of the predecessors who have been in this class, as well as David for letting me participate. And I'm going to have to cut out before 2 o'clock. Yeah, Larry's retiring, and he's off to submit a $12 million proposal that he's the PI on, right? <laughs> um, you know, one thing that, that I also want to say that, that I constantly confront, and any teacher always does, that I wonder if it's obvious to you, is there's so much about Apollo that we didn't cover. Right? Despite these, how many two-hour lectures, you know, we said very little about the Saturn system. We didn't talk at all about the guidance system for Saturn. We didn't say anything about the ground control networks, really, and the computing that was done on the ground. Telecom pieces of it. Uh, uh, um, I mean, can I ask you all the things that we skipped, right? And um, hopefully we, we got enough of the kind of disparate nodes in the network that if you go on and read more about Soviet uh, program or other pieces, you'll be able to connect those dots and it gives you the basic structure. That's true of any class that you teach and that's the constant struggle of, of putting a syllabus together is you got to leave so much out. Um, but, you know, we didn't do a class on Apollo 13. Or we didn't do a class on the fire, really. John covered it a little bit, I imagine, in, in lecture last week. Um, you know, on and on and on. So there's no sense that we even claim that we've covered this whole program, but we've grabbed a, a few of the highlights, heard a few of the first-hand pieces, and hopefully given that overall picture that then if you look deeper into, uh, you'll be able to, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, this program isn't going to go away, right? <laughs> it's, it's a nice thing about teaching history is it changes, we change the way that we understand it, but the Apollo program is going to be sort of one of the stories that gets told in your profession for the rest of your careers. And you'll always be able to impress your colleagues with how much detail you know. And, and, and uh, you know, my, um, we had dinner with Dave Scott at my house, and I invited my um, three and five year old niece and nephew to come meet him. You know, and, and the three year old little girl just looked up at him and said, I will always remember you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, you know, it won't be too long before there won't be a single person alive who walked on the moon. And you all will be able to say you met one of them. And, uh, uh, you know, that'll be a special thing. Other comments? Closing? 
I was just in a meeting yesterday where we're trying to figure out a kind of large scale how MIT should approach thinking about large scale systems. And someone said, well, we really ought to teach these classes where we look at particular systems in great detail and study them and, you know, look at how they get engineered with all the different layers of politics and organization. <laughs> I'm like, well, I teach a class like that. <laughs> I've been teaching that class for 10 years. And, um, and I, you know, what, one thing I love about this class, which I try to make true of every class I teach, it's a class you can really only take here at MIT. Um, you could take a similar class at another university based on something that that was involved locally there. It's a good model that way. But given the resources that we have, it's just um, very special to be able to teach this class here. You could probably teach it at, you know, University of Alabama Huntsville. You could teach it in a few other places in a different way. But um, at the level that we teach it here, it's, it's hard to imagine. And that's one of the great things. So. Um, all right, I'll turn it over to John and I'll uh, talk about Shuttle and Columbia and uh, uh, then we'll, uh, whatever time's left, we can, we can do group project stuff. Sorry? Are we going to get time to work? Yes. I, I, uh, let's see, how long do you need done? Well, maybe 45 minutes. I'll okay. try to go fast. So then you'll have 45 minutes at the end? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> okay, so. I thought what I would do is just kind of wrap up on on the shuttle because not not only is the shuttle sort of a, uh, a I think an important tie to Apollo, although um, shuttle program is much longer, thirty years of operational flights and and roughly ten years of development. So the last forty years, much of the history and legacy of shuttle is is sort of echoes on Apollo. The same engineering team that did Apollo largely designs. The shuttle. I tried to explain in the last talk the importance of the uh, trade-offs that were made, political trade-offs by the Nixon administration, by the Office of Management Budget, and how those drove sort of the, uh, uh, the ultimately the design, uh, which affected the operational costs and and I think largely the reliability of the system as well. So the the two accidents that occur, Challenger's on the 25th flight, um, Columbia's on the uh, 100 and 13th flight, and then the program wraps up at 135 flights. So there's uh, roughly 21 successful flights after uh, Columbia, probably at the highest level of the system reliability. But I'll show you that problems that were uh, encountered on the uh, Columbia accident related to the foam continue largely for the next uh, several missions after the return to flight. And it isn't until about the 10th mission that the uh, the foam the the uh, external tank is finally in a robust design configuration where foam is not likely to cause a major uh, event. Uh, obviously, the report is outstanding, and I would highly rec recommend it. Um, we actually did not talk much about the Apollo One fire, and and it, it, there are three major accidents in human spaceflight, three major investigations. Each of them are conducted differently with different. Uh, teams, part uh, right. They happen to all occur at the end of January, the beginning of February. Just a coincidence. The Apollo fire is investigated internally. Uh, Floyd Thompson, who's the head of NASA Langley, is the uh, is the chair. There is no presidential commission, and there are no independent outside uh, participants. Um, very different in Challenger. It's actually a presidential commission that's that's authorized by. Uh, President Reagan, uh, with William P. Rogers, the former Secretary of State, as the chair, Neil Armstrong as the deputy. Sally Ride is on that. She's the only person who is on both uh, Challenger and Columbia. The Columbia Investigation Board is set up with a uh, sort of an emergency response system that's, that is put in place by NASA, appointing largely outside investigators. Uh, and it's actually announced the day after the accident who those will be. It's headed up by Harold Gaiman, who did an outstanding job. He's a four-star admiral, um, extensive experience. I think he was the head of uh, Joint Forces Command. Uh, he, is, uh, he was the uh, principal investigator, the chair of the uh, commission that studied the USS Cole uh, 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 terrorist accident just before this. Um, and kind of coming full circle, and what I'm going to borrow on a lot today is uh, 10 years after Columbia. 
um, you know, sort of what, what transpired in that 10-year period, uh, the groups of people that were first-hand participants actually got together in uh, March at George Washington University for a one-day uh, conference, which was quite interesting, and it's available on C-SPAN, the video lectures, and all the charts are available on George Washington University's website. Uh, some excellent presentations, um, one by the uh, uh, Joe Dyer, who heads up the uh, NASA uh, Aerospace Safety uh, Panel. That's an independent body that was actually put in place after Apollo 1, after the fire. Uh, yeah, he's, he's no longer at iRobot, but he, for many years he, he was the president of iRobot. Um, and also, I thought one of the most interesting was that the, the, the last talk, if you, if you only have a chance to look at one and you're interested in this topic, watch the presentation at the end by Wayne Hale and uh, Harold Gaiman, because uh, Wayne Hale plays a pivotal role in the uh, shuttle program. It pretty much spans his entire career. He, joins NASA in the late 70s. He's, he's a critical player within the uh, Mission Operations Directorate, becomes a lead flight director, becomes the uh, ascent and entry flight director, which is sort of the most challenging uh, flight director position. On, I, think, I think he may have had that job for on the order of 20 different shuttle flights. And just as Columbia is happening, he gets a new position, which is the launch integration manager at Kennedy Space Center. And that plays into the uh, accident. So both Wayne Hale, by the way, after, after Columbia, uh, and he emerges as sort of one of the heroes, if you will, uh, he becomes the space shuttle program manager, manages the return to flight. And the first uh, dozen or so space shuttle missions after Columbia are run under the direction of, of Wayne Hale, who's now, now retired from NASA. Um, not going to repeat this because we've talked a lot about it, but the technical reasons were probably the uh, most straightforward to uh, determine. But uh, you saw the effort and expense that went into the test of that carbon-carbon uh, uh, leading edge at Southwest Research Institute. Um, that was it. Was not really necessary to do that from a from a uh, technical standpoint. The accident had already pinpointed the causes. Uh, but it's interesting in that talk I just referred to that Wayne Hale actually mentions he did not believe until he actually saw the impact on that test at Southwest Re Research Institute that the foam was the ultimate uh, cause and that many of the people that worked on the shuttle program sort of ref had been in the culture of uh, believing that uh, the, uh, the leading edge was uh, Strong and not and would not be uh, impacted in that way by by debris. That it was the, that that was sort of an eye-opening re re revelatory experience to actually see that test uh, sort of prove firsthand. Not only did the impact happen, um, in, not only did sort of the geometry work, but the actual uh, object that penetrated the wing box, the piece of carbon carbon, you know, matched the flight day two object within just a couple of square inches. It's pretty impressive. John, you know, I think one of the interesting things about that, about that was that they, there was a preliminary analysis done by Bo Boeing, I believe, while Columbia was still on Right, the crater, crater analysis. Right. And said, oh, there's no problem. That phone could not possibly have done the damage. Right. So the crater analysis was the, uh, the, the engineering tool that was used to basically, by the engineers to basically show what the uh, debris impact uh, would cause on the, on the tiles of, of the shuttle. It's a relatively crude uh, tool. It was developed, I think, in the early uh, 80s. It did not use all the advanced methods like finite element methods that, that really have become kind of state of the art in the last three decades. I think the other thing that's interesting about it is while, while they relied extensively on the crater model, uh, the other piece, w which I think is kind of fascinating, is uh, in that 30-year period, uh, composite uh, structural uh, non-destructive inspection techniques, NDI, had really uh, advanced. The state of the art in the industry had, had significantly uh, matured. Today, uh, ultrasonic inspection, 
uh, shirography, some of these methods are extremely capable of, of looking at the uh, underlying surface behind, behind composite materials. Um, up until the Columbia accident, the primary means, the primary and only means to inspect the leading edge of the space shuttle was coin tap test. None of the NDI methods that had evolved in the industry had, were, were being applied to the leading edge. So the creator model that you referred to, the NDI techniques, many of these things were kind of stuck in, you know, what I think of as sort of the, the era when the shuttle was designed and first brought into service, the late 70s and early 80s, but not, uh, did not progress. And it's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, the, the, those methods are then used extensively in the return to flight. They're basically uh, described pretty extensively in the return to flight documents. Well, to be fair to tools like the Crater Tool, it worked accurately for the range of damage it was intended to model, which was very small pieces of foam or ice hitting any part of the shuttle thermal protection system. Right. And there's no reason to believe that it didn't work for those things. It wasn't designed for pieces of foam 5,000% larger right. than, than it was validated for. And uh, I think an interesting piece of that is because it was built in the 80s, although there was documentation that existed, most of the people using the tool didn't actually know the limitations mm -hmm. of it because they, you know, it was handed to them by somebody to whom it was handed by somebody else. Right. And so there's a loss of institutional knowledge that occurred. Right. But um, I think that's a good point. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's aimed at predicting the, the uh, impact on smaller impacts to the thermal tiles. It wasn't really... Uh, set up to, to it's, it's a classic case of people trusting a computer simulation without understanding what was going on inside the box and um, what the limitations and the assumptions and things were that went into that simulation for all the reasons that you said. It, it was developed at North American and then handed over. handed over and NASA had this whole NAS knowledge management program which didn't do either of those two things. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So you're talking about these engineers like Mike Neal that said that I, we needed to see the actual test that right. the Southwest Research Institute yeah. uh, did to, to realize the actual cause was what was their theory with the cause was their captive theory. So well, I think I think they by that point, you know, it was it was it had been proven that that uh, the impact caused it. But until they visually saw it, until they many of them were witnesses in in the crowd. I mean, as that impact occurred, there was a gasp from many people in the crowd. Uh, you know, seeing it visually, I think Sheila Woodnall was there. A lot of the members of the investigation board were actually there. I don't know if Wayne Hale was. He he may have been. So it's just the, the, and that's really you'll hear them talk about. That's really why that test was so important. It it proved beyond a doubt that uh, all of the. They were proved wrong. I. That's a good question. I think the. I think the. Uh, Evidence quickly led to the foam impact, and if you sort of look within days of the accident, uh, most of the, of the uh, uh, conclusions are leading that way. But but a lot of other things are are explored. I mean, one of the things that Columbia actually had asymmetrical um, boundary layer separation on an earlier mission, and people were looking a lot at that. You know, did the link did the left wing, which had the had more roughness. Did that, you know, so the, the breakup at hypersonic speeds was not fully understood. So there were a lot of, you know, there were even people looking at these uh, noctilucent, I think it's called, these high altitude clouds that could have uh, created an unusual level of turbulence. I mean, there's a lot of things that were studied as alternatives, but quickly the foam emerged as the leading one. What does it take to convince people? And in, in this case, even though these are all highly technical people, the answer is more than just the data. And it really, I, I asked Sheila about this recently. She said, by the time we did that test, the, the board was thoroughly convinced this was the cause. Right. And, but we really had to do that test. But people like Wayne Hale and many of the other people inside the shuttle program, they had already, during the flight, convinced themselves that that very thing was not possible, right? So it wasn't just a matter of what's the cause of the accident. It's a matter of we have already talked ourselves into an opposite conclusion that had huge consequences. What does it take for us to come around to another conclusion? And the demo and the kind of 
I mean, again, it's a typical thing in, in a lot of things, right? You know, you can, you can show PowerPoint all you want, but a real demo of a difficult, complicated engineering situation is, persu is the thing that often seals the, the cake for people. And, um, you know, there are any number of cases of, uh, uh, of that sort of thing. So, um, so the uh, space shuttle management, uh, space shuttle program is managed uh, through a lot of uh, complex uh, organizations, uh, both within NASA and within the contractor base. By this point, uh, the, uh, a contracting entity was effectively set up called United Space Alliance. It had been a joint venture of, I think, Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Uh, Boeing had acquired uh, North American Rockwell. Uh, Lockheed Martin had, uh, portion, had the external tank uh, project. So uh, this is also multi-center based. It's, it's largely at, at Johnson Space Center and Kennedy, but also Marshall plays a pivotal role. Um, there's, this is the NASA Administrator, Sean O'Keefe. Bill Reedy is the head of human spaceflight. Michael Kostelnik is basically in charge of the shuttle program. He's a military guy that was, was brought in. And then the Space Shuttle Program Office, Ron Dittmore, is in charge. The MMT, which you hear a lot about, the Mission Management Team, actually reported into the Space Shuttle Program Office. When the MMT is at uh, Kennedy before the mission, the launch integration manager leads it. So in that case, it was Wayne Hale. When it moves to Houston after the uh, launch, then the, uh, uh, the Houston-based uh, Space Shuttle Integration Manager uh, leads it, in that case, uh, Linda Hamm. And these different organizations report in different ways. So the, um, the debris assessment team, which is the team that's basically asking for more data, asking for the national assets to be utilized to image the shuttle under uh, Rodney Rocha, and you'll see some emails from him. Uh, that team reports now through, uh, it's not even shown well here, but that team is, is within the shuttle engineering office and they, may, they basically go to Wayne Hale, who is at uh, Kennedy Space Center, and he gets involved in trying to bring a, on the, the national assets uh, within the Department of Defense. Uh, that's ultimately shut down by the MMT. So um, the, the way this works, there's, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sort of the kind of the pivotal meetings. This is an MMT meeting. This is not the meeting uh, prior to Columbia, but it's, it's from a latter mission. It's a fairly large group. There's, there's probably 30 people at the table, and then you can see a lot of people uh, behind. These are the different entities that are represented uh, in the uh, MMT. Um, the MMT's first meeting is two days before the launch. They basically pick up from where the flight readiness review uh, leaves off, um, and they, they're effectively responsible for dealing with any <coughs> issue that the, either the launch director during the terminal countdown or the flight director during the, the mission itself can't resolve. So the launch director and the flight director have the ultimate responsibilities for the real-time decisions, but issues that sort of go beyond real-time uh, on the conduct of the mission get, get, are resolved at the, at the level of the MMT. Uh, the flight readiness review is an even bigger group. This is also post-Columbia, uh, but you can see this is a this is a room filled with probably uh, 200 people. Um, the Flight Re Readiness Review is actually chaired by the uh, Office of uh, Space Flight, the Associate Administrator. So in this case, it would have been Bill Reedy. Um, they basically meet about two weeks before uh, the launch and uh, certify that the, the mission is ready for flight. And Flight Readiness Review is a common engineering uh, discipline that you know, you'll see throughout the industry. It's not unique to this. To this program. Um, what is unique, I think, is that the pivotal issue of the foam bipod uh, 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 on the external tank is not even discussed at this uh, flight readiness review. And the reason is, this is so keep in mind the, the, the uh, foam occurred, the, the, the prior, not the prior mission, STS 113, but the mission just before that, STS 112 had uh, the bipod foam uh, break off during ascent. So it was the prior FRR, if you're following this, the FRR that was held for STS-113 that ultimately resolved the foam uh, bipod 
on the external tank. These are actual charts from that uh, flight readiness review. So that flight readiness review took place on October 31. The mission flew in November. Um, this is the chart that describes the foam uh, loss. Uh, external tank thermal protection system foam loss over the life of the shuttle has never been a safety of flight issue. More than 100 external tanks have flown with only three documented instances of significant foam loss on the bipod ramp. The bipod ramp. So this is the this is the uh, this is the bipod. It's this is the shadow of it. It's it's sort of like this that that connects the the front of the uh, orbiter to the to the external tank. Um, now this is not really true. I mean, in fact, uh, that last statement is not true uh, in terms of the number of uh, incidences. This is the next chart that they used uh, without going into it in detail. Um, the, uh, the bottom line is the external tank is safe to fly with no new concerns and no added uh, risk. Now, 113 occurs without, any, uh, without uh, losing the bipod uh, foam. However, because this issue got resolved in the FRR for 113, it was not even discussed in the flight readiness review for STS-107. Uh, these are the actual prior uh, losses of uh, bipod foam that occurred. So um, now three of, the, three of those were, were known at the time. These are the three that that flight readiness review memo referred to. Uh, th this was the this is the fourth one, I guess, on, on, uh, on Atlantis on 112. Um, so prior to SDS-107, six instances. Again, if you extrapolate this to, uh, so that Columbia was the seventh, if you extrapolate it to nighttime conditions that weren't imaged, about 12 uh, events occurred. So one in, one in 10 missions had sustained this uh, particular piece of bipod foam coming off, and you could see the rough, you know, sizes in some cases. Uh, this one was 800 uh, square uh, cubic inches. Yeah. Four of those six are listed as being on Columbia, but the external tank is. So that really doesn't matter. I mean, the, those the external tank is different, and right. So it's the external tank is a expendable tank. It's unique to each mission. It has its own numbering system and, and the actual orbiters uh, don't really matter in terms of the performance of the tank. It's just coincidentally that Columbia has more cameras on it. Some of the other ones were never equipped. Uh, but but now that so these are these are prime so these are uh, it's a good question but not the right conclusion. They, these are actually um, f photographs taken. There's a procedure after they uh, shut down the main engines to immediately uh, have the crew on orbit photograph the external tank as it's separating from from the orbiter. So, uh, and that would have to also be in daylight conditions for that imagery to work. And you know, sometimes they they got a very good high res focused image. Sometimes they they didn't. But imagery became a big issue. So, uh, ground based imagery of the launch uh, was largely systems that were left over from the Apollo uh, era. Nothing had been up graded. And the most pivotal view, uh, the cameras that had the best uh, optical view of the uh, debris strike were actually out of focus on the, on the day of the flight. Uh, quite a bit of work was done to upgrade the ground-based imagery. Radars were installed that could uh, detect uh, foam loss even on a night launch. And on the first two launches, the WB-57, which is a high altitude airplane flying at about 60,000 feet, a NASA asset was used to image both uh, 114 and 121 on the return to flight. So quite a bit of imaging, both in ascent as well as on orbit with this orbital boom inspection system that was put in place. Um, the original external tank requirement is that foam shedding damage was not allowed. And as I discussed, not only was it these six events, but you know foam occurred throughout the history of the program. So the Normalization of deviance, the unexpected became the expected, which became the accepted. Um, so I, I, I don't think that. If you go back one. Yeah. I really don't think that the slide in the lower left is, is, is really fair. 
because there's really two kinds of, of foam shedding failures that are occurring here, right? There's one su small subset of cases in which a very large piece of foam, you know, tens to hundreds of cubic inches, is falling off and striking the orbiter. And almost all of the rest of them are very small pieces of foam, which they did have on almost every launch, and they never found a way to fix it. Um, and, and it sounds like maybe they did after 10 launches after Columbia. Yeah, I mean, but effectively, the, the, the system was not designed to take even the small uh, foam strikes on the, on, the, uh, on the TPS, the thermal protection system. So uh, understood, even... but it is always the case that when you engineer something and it's a really hard thing that you're engineering, you're going to have behavior that was not expected in the first place. Mm -hmm. and so the, problem, the question is, is this something that you have fully bound? Is this a problem you have fully bounded and you understand? There's a difference. Like small foam strikes, they did, they had the crater tool, they actually did the analysis. There's no evidence to suggest that there's any scenario in which a very small piece of foam striking the thermal protection system breaches the orbiter. Mm -hmm. However, there's a completely different set, a much smaller set of these large strikes, which they never did fully characterize. Okay, so th these large strikes are, are only from the bipod foam. So there's many other large pieces of foam that are coming off the shuttle. So to assume that it's only small pieces uh, is not correct. And you'll see on the return to flight, the PAL ramp uh, fails, which is actually a, another large piece of foam. So it's, it's, fo it's foam. It's a wide range of foam sizes and shapes that are coming off. They're tolerated really from STS-1 forward. That chart, though, mm -hmm. almost all of those red dots are very small. Like, that, I believe the y-axis there is cubic inches, and then the x-axis is launch. I, I can't really read it on this one, but I, uh, I no, read this, this is, report, I so. think this is number, this is number of events. A number of events. Yeah, over the life of the program. There, there are some missions where uh, hundreds of foam strikes are, are observed. Um, I mean, it's fair, it's fair to look at every, uh, ca the causality of, of all of the f foam events, both in terms of the size of the foam and the impact velocity. It's heavily determined by the point in the mission which that occurs based on velocity and, and mass. Uh, the sweet spot that's, you know, where the damage can, uh, can occur is largely between about 30 seconds and 2 minutes and 15 seconds. That minute 45, so you know you could tolerate foam loss after a minute 40, uh, after two minutes and 15 seconds elapsed time and not have impact uh, because the uh, atmospheric density is, is low. The, so the velocity is high, but the atmospheric density is low. So small impacts were not a problem, probably correctly. They assumed that the big impacts were not a problem. Yeah, and and they the didn't draw that line. And do the F equals M. That's the thing that surprised me about that final demo is like, you know, you can still have a small M and a big A, and that makes a big F, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, so, and then these... That's my point. It's just that, like, you, you, you can't take away as, a, as your assumption from Columbia that, oh, you know, every time something goes wrong against the requirements that were originally laid out, like, what were they going to do? Shut down the entire shuttle program? Well, probably what they should have done is recertify the... Uh, capability of the thermal protection system to withstand foam impacts. I mean, the, the, largely that's what happened uh, in this in the return to flight. The the process was effectively recertifying the uh, external tank through a series of design changes, uh, through a series of inspection techniques, and you, you'll see that. I, I want to get to that. Maybe right. at the end we can talk more. Sure. You're raising some good points, but effectively that's what happened. The the foam. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, tolerance of the uh, of the orbiter to to foam strikes was resolved through design change and recertification, if you will, of the of the external tank and a better understanding of of the mechanisms. And that's what this next chart is. These are direct quotes uh, from the AXA investigation board, and I think it goes to the, some of the points that David was making that um, these management decisions. Uh, reflect missed opportunities, blocked or ineffective communication channels, flawed analysis, and in ineffective leadership. That um, you know, it's this 
it's all of these players, whether it's the MMT, the Shuttle Program Office, the Mission Evaluation Room, the MER, which is an Apollo uh, uh, organizational entity that consists of engineers that support the, uh, the mission management team, the flight director, the uh, key elements of mission control, really displayed no interest in understanding of the, of the foam problem and its, and its uh, implications. And that gets into this whole idea that, uh, you know, this, this fundamental question, was this a safety of flight concern, was either answered as no or was really, you know, never, never answered. Um, the management techniques that were used, sort of the culture of the organization, resulted in these blind spots that prevented them from seeing the impact. Uh, and that's what this is really about, is looking at sort of organizational causes, what, what, were, what were the basis of those. The, the Accident Investigation Board actually looks at the nuclear uh, naval uh, nuclear reactor safety program as uh, an example of uh, comparable technology in a, in a, in a comparably complex uh, system with a much more, uh, uh, with a higher level of, of safety. Now there, there have been accidents on nuclear reactors as well. But uh, these span, you know, decades. In some cases, they deal with obsolete uh, systems that are being uh, phased out. But they, what, what the team did was look at the culture of uh, the Navy reactor program as a, as a comparable engineering and management culture that the shuttle program could be compared to. Um, you know, the conclusions were basically that that there was a broken safety culture. Perhaps the most perplexing question was how can NASA have missed the signals that the foam was sending? Um, in most cases, the human spaceflight program, by the way, these are direct quotes from the, from the board. Human spaceflight program is extremely aggressive in reducing threats to safety, but these blind spots uh, existed. Um, and, you know, this is, it's evident in both in the testimony that occurred uh, before the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, which is all publicly available, as well as in the emails and, and other means of communication that were used. Um, the NASA managers that were interviewed basically said not only was there no safety of flight issue, but we couldn't have done anything about it anyway. Um, and that's, you know, that's sort of a core uh, point. Um, also that, um, the, the lack of robust uh, engineering data and, and rigorous testing. So this is, I'll just show a couple of those memos. This is one uh, from the uh, uh, a SAM as uh, Subsystem Area Manager. USA is United Space Lines. TPS is Thermal Protection System. So this is the subject matter expert for uh, the foam uh, within the United Space Alliance, basically uh, saying that uh, the, uh, the impact data uh, says that the structure would get slightly hotter but would still be okay. So this is to the, um, to the other managers at, at United uh, Space Alliance. Um, this is the uh, uh, memo from uh, Leroy Kane, who's the lead uh, ascent and entry uh, flight director basically saying the space shuttle program was asked directly if they had any interest in requesting resources outside of NASA to view the orbiter. They said no. Um, this is a total of three times requests were made for images and, and eight times sort of missed opportunities occurred. Now everyone is sort of looking through the evidence of the accident through their own sort of lens. I think that's an important way to look at it. People that love to talk about PowerPoint, this is uh, the, the Yale professor that, uh, Tufty, this is his chart, uh, picking out uh, examples from the uh, discussion of the crater tool that we just talked about, the use of the word significant five times, the lack of characterizing any of this numerically. Um, this was the memo to the crew, which I think I also talked about last time. This is from uh, the on-orbit flight director, uh, Steve Stitch, to the pilot and commander of the shuttle. Uh, prompting them for what's going to become a PAO event, a public affairs event. This item is not even worth mentioning. There is no concern for RCC. We have seen this phenomenon on several other flights, and there's absolutely no concern for entry. 
really goes to the organizational structure of the, of the shuttle program. Uh, there is a safety and mission assurance uh, organization, but it's generally viewed as not extremely effective in, in, uh, in this uh, particular uh, accident. It, does, it doesn't have the independence that it should have. Um, and I talked a little bit about this last time, so I won't repeat, but there's a whole history of effectively these 87 missions between Challenger and Columbia in the context of a declining budget uh, where the shuttle workforce and the budget is reduced by about 40 percent. I talked about the Kraft report, which was uh, chaired by Chris Kraft, who's really one of the heroes of the Apollo program and of human spaceflight in, in, in general, uh, recommending that the program be further cost reduced and that some of those savings could actually come out of things like, um, like the, uh, the safety uh, budget. Um, there was an attitude developed, that developed during Apollo that led to NASA viewing itself as the perfect place. And this is a Chris Kraft quote, it's not arrogance if you really are that good. Uh, and, you know, sort of this image of NASA as a, uh, the NASA culture, which was affected uh, really by Apollo, but other, other successes as well played a key role, role here. Resistant to external suggestions for change, and this, you know, again, is after, after, the, after the Challenger accident, but before Columbia, flawed decision-making, self-deception, introversion, and diminished curiosity. I think the word curiosity is really important in, in terms of the, the way the organization dealt with the, the problem. This is the actual Kraft report. Um, NASA should re restructure and reduce the overall safety, reliability, and quality assurance elements and that could be done without reducing safety. And that was, you know, literally debated, discussed, and some of those recommendations were actually implemented. Echoes of, of Challenger, this was coined by Sally Ride, who was on both commissions, Diane Vaughn's report. Um, she was, uh, <clears throat> she testified before the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. I thought it was one of the most interesting uh, pieces of testimony because they basically asked her after this book came out, which was uh, about five years after the, Colum uh, after the Challenger accident around 1992, did anyone at NASA ask you to come and speak to us about your, the conclusions of your book? And she said no. And then did, any, did anyone ever contact you about this book? And, and she said no, I didn't get any contact from anyone at NASA. I did get a call from my former boyfriend. but. Um, Wayne Hale uh, comments in this Columbia Plus 10 uh, seminar that I talked about that uh, he did not read this book until after Challenger, but then it, when he read it, it was the first time that he really understood what it meant to be an engineer working in an engineering organization. So it's a, it's a very telling book by a sociologist who really kind of examines what is the culture uh, at, at NASA. She coins the term normalization of deviance. The unexpected becomes the expected, becomes the accepted. The machine was talking, but no one was, was listening. Um, Has anybody read that book in class? I mean, it, I mean, this story that John's telling is a, a remarkable story, especially for someone like me in my line of work, because it's very similar to the kind of work that I do. And I, I read this book right when it came out, and Diane was here in town, so we interacted with her a lot. And, and there were a lot of junky books that came out about Challenger, and it wasn't necessarily that easy for someone to see that this one was a scholarly book and different from a lot of them. Um, but it, it, it is astonishing to me that Wayne Hale said in this thing he didn't read this book until after Columbia, and that the people who were most directly involved had no interest in learning about the dynamics that went on. And the Columbia accident from an organizational perspective is almost exactly the same as the Challenger accident. They did exactly the same thing twice. And, you know, um, the reports are very different. The first report focuses on the O-ring, you know, in the famous case of, of uh, what's his name, Feynman and whatnot. The second report says, this accident was rooted in history and culture. And they drew on Diane Vaughn, they drew on Nancy Levison, they drew on John Logston. They had a lot more kind of broad understanding of what was going on, even though the accident was very similar in terms of its characteristics. So 
<clears throat> this is the this is sort of the echoes of Challenger, and I talked about this last time, but I wanted to point out this is also used by Tufty that when this data is presented the first time, it's the data is is presented of only these uh, incidences, not the number of flights that were actually held at higher temperature, nor is the data presented in this form, which would actually show the projected uh, temperatures uh, the day before the, the Challenger launch. So that's a reconstructed chart, not the actual one that was used, and then similar to the foam impact events uh, on it that occurred on every shuttle launch. Um, this chapter is another, I think, important one that talks about engineering culture. Uh, an accident waiting to happen is nothing more than a normal technology. Normal technology is unruly. Uh, practices do not follow rules. Rather, rules follow evolving practices. Um, and you know, much that I think can be said about uh, the problem of management decision making, and, and it's really engineers making decisions. We talked about this the other day. It's, these are engineers who have become managers. None of the d players uh, throughout that entire chain, with I think probably the, the only exception being the NASA administrator himself, that from Bill Reedy all the way through Linda Hamm, uh, Wayne Hale, all the decision makers were degreed engineers who had worked on this program extensively as engineers before they became engineering managers. So this is kind of the, the point I'm trying to make about, you know, even just outside of the foam things, there's. You know, I think we mentioned, or you mentioned in the last, in the last lecture, there were 2,000 open tickets about yeah. the space shuttle. Over 3,000. 3,000. The, the point is, there will always be open tickets about any complex system. Right. The question is, how do you tell which ones are going to blow up your system and which ones are things that you can muddle through? And, and you always have to muddle through things. You will never have the resources to do everything right. So... How do you tell when you're moving from a situation where it's under control and it's a well-bounded problem to a situation where this is now outside of the scope of our past engineering history? In both of these cases, the specific kind of damage which resulted in the Columbia loss and the specific kind of damage which resulted in uh, the Challenger loss, they're in a family of a lot of damage of similar types, but they differ in a radically different there, there's one aspect of it that is very different. Like in the foam case, it, it's um, a, a much larger piece of foam. And in the uh, O-ring case, it's a radically different temperature. But they didn't understand how that changed the set of assumptions that were going in for the previous set of similar looking things, foam strikes, and actually had O-ring problems beforehand. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's that transition, which is the important and difficult thing to do, and what is what makes these sorts of disasters very hard, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like, oh, there was a problem, why didn't they fix it? That you, ne you never can. And so, yeah. So I'll, I'll keep going with this, and I'll, I'll show you some data that was done at the end of the program that sort of... That very issue was raised in response to both of these accidents, particularly by the shuttle folks themselves. But the both of the reports say, no, this was one. I mean, it's a real issue, right? Yeah, they, they can and should have predicted it in both cases. I'm not at all saying I mean, that, like... The, the, the great quote from, it's from one of the people in the Columbia, it's in the Columbia board, they said, the system was talking to us and we weren't listening, which is yeah. a great one. That's the one I keep in mind as an engineer right. when I'm dealing with something and you say, what is it trying to tell us that we're not hearing? Um, and... No. Where's the signal? Where's the noise? Yeah. So hopefully I'm going to show you a few things maybe that you haven't seen, which which talk to that point. We should other... wrap up. We have about five minutes, though. Sure. Just to give. I'll, I'll some jump time. ahead. Yeah. Um, by the way, there was a very good opportunity to re that the sh this, this shuttle could have been saved on orbit. The accident board looks at that at that issue. Um, these are the changes that actually are put in place after uh, Columbia on, on the return flight. An independent uh, safety center is set up, the NESC, and NESC at uh, NASA Langley, uh, that's independent from the shuttle program office. Um, but it's largely a work in pro progress. This is the rationale. This is a chart that Wayne Hale presented recently. This is sort of the rationale of... of uh, solving the external tank uh, foam problem, eliminating critical debris, um, 
this is through the the redesign of the of the of the foam uh, extensive uh, uh, both ascent based and and on orbit uh, imaging uh, to detect uh, uh, debris impact um, and then special procedures that would involve uh, potential repair of, of foam on on orbit so what did that really do this is the chart he, he Wayne Hale used at this uh, conference which basically says, okay, 20% uh, of the risk is related to the thermal protection system by eliminating ascent debris, uh, improving uh, inspection techniques, and potentially having contingency methods for, for the crew uh, sort of safe harbor at the International Space Station, but the risk of TPS damaging the shuttle had been significantly reduced. But then what about all other risk? Well, all the other risk could be impacted, and these, you know, again, don't have numbers. All other risks could be impacted by enhancing systems uh, engineering, uh, better oversight, cultural change, uh, but that you still are left with a significant amount of risk on the system. <clears throat> Where I think that's particularly telling is this is the actual chart that was prepared by the Space Shuttle Program Office prior to the return to flight, uh, which was uh, in uh, June of 2005 before the launch of STS-114. Uh, these are these are identified as the top program risks. Uh, they 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 agree to fly effectively with a with a known problem on the external tank, the feed line bellows, and then if you sort of look through uh, the others, uh, things like uh, schedule uh, for the launch processing of both 114 and a uh, launch on demand uh, rescue mission. Threats to SSP reserve, that's basically uh, a management, you know, financial reserve uh, of, the, of the program. So that's not a technical risk, it's really a programmatic risk. Even in more detail, the, uh, this is prepared by the Marshall Space Flight Center external tank. These are typical risk charts with likelihood of risk, uh, one being low, five being high, and, and consequence. So you want to avoid being in the, in the red. The external tank uh, office, basic, and the space shuttle main engine, this is effectively the co combined propulsion, um, does not even list what becomes the biggest uh, risk to that mission, which is the, the loss of the PAL ramp foam, uh, which actually occurs in that, in that return to flight. So the launch occurs on July 26 at 127 seconds, right in the sweet spot of, of the, uh, the impact uh, range, this large piece of foam uh, separates from the, from the external tank. There's a smaller piece of foam that separates at 147 seconds. The shuttle program is effectively grounded. Uh, an additional flight is created to uh, revalidate the return to flight, uh, STS-121. Uh, that, uh, this is a typo, but that launches on July 4, 2006, about a year uh, later. There are several redesigns of the external tank that occur. Uh, foam shedding events continue on several post-Columbia missions. The external tank uh, 120, which happens to be also launched on STS-120, the seventh shuttle mission in October 2007, is the first one that really incorporates all of the design changes that are recommended by the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. And then three missions later, uh, do they actually solve the final uh, configuration of the design. So it isn't until uh, well, Long and short of that, is when they did the return to flight, they made all the same mistakes again. Right. And they almost lost discovery. Right. That. So Wayne Hale and his blog, and it's a great article, How, how, we, how we Almost Lost Discovery. Now that program, uh, the return to, one of the challenges is, okay, we should wrap the, it up though, John. Okay. Um, they spend $2.7 and only a tiny amount is, is allocated by Congress. Uh, so there's a massive uh, requirement for reprogramming, which effectively comes out of the other programs. Uh, this, this is probably the most important paragraph in the entire report. The nation committed to building an amazing if compromised vehicle. While well, the agency did this, it accepted the bargain to operate and maintain the vehicle in the safest possible way. The board is not convinced that NASA has completely lived up to that bargain or that Congress and the administration have provided the, the funding and support. Um, 
this is the most pivot, this is a, an important chart because it shows effectively my, the critical milestone decisions A, B, and C, and initial operating used in the Department of Defense widely and, and at NASA. So that by milestone uh, B, you've only spent 10% of your program budget, but you've locked in 90, 85, 90% of your ultimate life cycle costs and uh, risk of the program. So what are the real risks? Well, this is a chart that was done in uh, January of 11. It's very, at the very end of the program, three missions before the end, that shows probability of risk. Uh, again, largely retrospective, uh, but basically says that there was a 6% likelihood that, um, that you could have made it to the 25th mission without a loss of uh, vehicle or crew and that uh, another 7% likelihood that uh, we could have made it through uh, effectively the, the, the time of the uh, Columbia accident without a loss of, of crew. And that by the time the program was concluded, the risk of loss was about 1 in 90. But at the time of the first launches, uh, it was about 1 in 10. And that 1 in 10, the number that was advertised in the by NASA and the media was one in a thousand, so two orders of magnitude uh, difference. Those change over time. I'm not going to go into them. Uh, you might be interested in this chart because it looks at sort of all of the other uh, systems that were being tolerated with the kind of risk that uh, was compiled. Sometimes, in the case of the solid rocket booster, the redesign lowered the risk, but those red, uh, those ones that are outlined in red, including orbiter uh, flight software being updated. Space Shuttle main engine uncontained failure. This is on-orbit debris strikes, uh, APU issues. Uh, all of those were basic, basically major risks throughout the, throughout the program. So um, that led to effectively the presidential decision uh, that was made in January of 2004 to retire rather than recertify the shuttle and begin the development of Constellation. Um, now, I think this is sort of the perfect storm of human spaceflight that uh, over the last decade after uh, Challenger, this is the, the accident, the return to flight, 21 missions of, of, the, uh, orb, of, of the space shuttle system. At the same time, Constellation is being developed. And if you look at this window in, in, in the 0910 frame, the commercial crew program has started, and there's actually a fourth human spaceflight program on top of this, which is the ISS. So NASA, again, without the budget to do it, with the return to flight being programmed out of, out of, uh, out of reprogramming, uh, basically an impossible mission to conduct human spaceflight, four separate programs with uh, no incremental uh, budget. So. Um, I think the important thing to take from this is to, to look at, the wherever you go to work, uh, look at the culture of the organization that you're operating in and try to understand that culture. Culture is the hardest thing to change. It is possible to change a culture, but it's usually a multi-year, if not generational uh, process. And clearly, the, the culture was part of the issues. And, and you see that with these comments that I think are being made uh, as late as 10 years after the uh, program. So. That's any other questions? Uh, thank you. Yeah, there is a question back there. Yeah, I just kind of, uh, really recommend the shuttle program in general. It'd be the accident investigation board report. I think that's clearly the best uh, document overall because it looks at both the technology, the Columbia, one. Yeah. the Columbia accident investigation board report, which is a PDF you can easily. It has download. a lot of the history of the shuttle in it. Right. It does look really nice, but it's also shockingly readable for a government report. Right. And I should say, you know, when that accident happened and that report was happening through Sheila, I think, or I'm not sure, they came to MIT, they said, who wants to come down and work for the summer to write this? And at the time, um, you know, there were people around who did. It was, you know, a lot of people we knew were involved mm -hmm. in that report. I was going to ask you a question about the presentation you made last week. Yep. Or two weeks ago, and one was on the first shuttle one. Right. When they were estimating 60 missions per year, yeah. do people actually believe that? Yes. <laughs> like that was, you're talking about manned lunar bases, and you, they, yeah. they thought that that was all going to be financially feasible. Well, the, the, the assumption was that 
the combination of military launches, commercial launches, and, and NASA launches would, would uh, uh, achieve that uh, 60 uh, flights per year, the, the, the basic model. Now, what really happened is uh, the uh, commercial launch industry rapidly moved to lower uh, cost systems like the Ariane 4 uh, and the U.S. monopoly on launches, which we enjoyed in the 60s and 70s, effectively became now competitive in the, in the 80s with the French and ultimately uh, the Russians and even the Chinese entered. Uh, so uh, post-Challenger, uh, a public law, which was signed by the pr President Reagan, basically precluded commercial satellites from flying on the shuttle. So I think it was largely the uh, Department of Defense decommitting and the commercial schedule never coming to fruition. That, that earlier forecast was all NASA, and I'm not sure anyone believed that, but that originally was used. And then as DOD, that, it sort of migrated to DOD and commercial, but the numbers stayed the same. So this, that economic argument makes a lot of sense from a, like a top line dollar analysis, mm -hmm. but how did they ever justify the infrastructure that they were building? I mean, they have one launch site, you know. Well, two. Vandenberg would have done it. Okay, two. But in that, but in that situation, you have two launch locations physically separated, so you can't have all five orbiters in the same place. Right. You know, if you assume one orbiter's down at any time for well, some kind of maintenance. So the plan was to go beyond five. I mean, the Five was the initial production of the orbiters. If, you know, even that was a bit of a stretch. I mean, they they took um, Challenger was actually the structural test article. Uh, Endeavor was not built until after the Challenger accident. It was sort of uh, in in mothballs, if you will. But when the shuttle program was developed, each shuttle, each orbiter was designed for a hundred missions. So. Uh, that 500 uh, manifest, which covered about 12 years, would end at around 1990. The assumption was you'd continue to build orbiters or that you'd have a new program. And that's where this real issue goes to the lack of national leadership. Several failed attempts at subsequent programs to the shuttle, and virtually all of them failed through about a 20-year period. Billions of dollars spent, uh, nothing really to, to show for it. Right. Just like even assuming you don't have to do any servicing on the shuttles, they're just like magically ready to go after they land. Two week turnaround, which was pivotal to that assumption. Uh, but even with a two week turnaround, it like takes almost two weeks to drive the damn shuttle out to the launch pad. The, the you've only got one of them. Yeah, the fastest turnaround ever done was when they decided uh, there was a mission that flew where they decided to. Um, the fuel cell failed. They came back early. They decided to refly the same mission with the exact same payload and the exact same crew. And the, the, the uh, turnaround time was 90 days. So that's the, right. the shortest they ever did. What I, what I, th what I think's so never been really documented is, is the process by which operationally, early on, that two-week number began to look so absurd on the ground. Right. And that how it sort of dawned on the organization and the people and filtered its way up that this was a lot more complicated to turn around than we had realized. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen that really articulated anywhere. Right. They um, never even tried to build two launch pads for the damn thing <laughs> at the same location. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it doesn't seem like there's any universe with any set of mathematical assumptions which allows you to get 60 launches a year or whatever it was they were talking about. I mean, it a may lot have well been before the first flight because, again, you know, the budget constraints are so tight and... Um, a lot of that led up to the schedule pressure on, on Challenger in 1985. I think that was the peak year of, of eight launches. They were pushing it very, very hard. They actually, that was, Challenger was the first uh, launch off uh, This is all, by the way, why, and this is a whole other story, but when our little space policy group in 2008 recommended the cancellation of Constellation, it was for all of these reasons, is that you could go through both Columbia and Challenger reports and you could find all the things that led to those accidents, and you could see exactly how they were all being recreated in the course of the Constellation program, and there was no way that it was going to have anything but a serious accident early in the program, given those conditions. Okay, okay thank you.